Uh, so American Dervish, for those of you who don't know, it is, is basically told from the point of view of Hayek Shah, who is between the ages of 10 and 12 in the book. And the book isn't narrated from the point of view of a 10 year old or 12 year old, it's narrated from the point of view of a 20 something year old looking back on when he was 10, 10 to 12. And his parents are secular, Muslims, not particularly interested in religion exactly in the ways that I described, and really much more interested in making each other's lives miserable. They have this awful marriage. I mean, very fractious and constantly bickering. And, and um, Hyatt, it's a pretty dour household. And so Hyatt's the only child. And into this kind of like dour house arrives this beautiful, brilliant Pakistani woman whose name is Mina Ali, and she is Hyatt's mom's best friend from childhood, who is living in Pakistan, but has gone through this awful divorce in Pakistan where she has now as a four-year-old kid, and she was leaving Pakistan to come to America to rebuild her life, and so she comes to stay with, with Hyatt's family. And when she arrives, she's like this, I remember reading about Robert Wise, who is a great Hollywood editor and director from the from the golden age of Hollywood, worked with Orson Welles. For those of you who don't know who Orson Welles is, Orson Welles is the greatest genius in American <laughs> cinema. <laughs> At the age of 26, made a film that he wrote and starred in called Citizen Kane, which remains to this day, many people believe, the greatest movie ever made. He was 26, had never made a movie before. Robert Wise used to talk about what it was like to be around Orson Welles. He said it was the first time he had ever experienced true genius in his life, and the only time in his life that he ever experienced it. And the way that he knew it was that when Orson Welles was in the room, Robert Wise would have different kinds of thoughts spontaneously just being around him. Orson Welles left, he wouldn't be thinking those kinds of things. I think this is happening. <laughs> We've all been around people like that, right? who have this capacity to sort of shift our consciousness. So Mina Ali is one of these people. She's devout, she's enlightened, she's liberated, she's, she's, she's beholden to the tradition, she's literary, she's religious, she's a sexual being, she's a religious devotee all of these wonderful contradictions that she lives very deeply and fully and also tragically. But Hyatt is at that age when manhood is just beginning to come into his body and into his consciousness. And he doesn't know what these transformations are, but they're happening in relation to this extraordinary person who is completely opening up new vistas of experience for him. And by new vistas, I don't just mean like there's things happening in his body, and they're happening because of this amazingly beautiful woman that he's around. So I'm going to read you a little section that is from, taken from one more thing you need to know, is that when Mina arrives, when Mina arrives, she realizes that, that her, Hyatt's parents haven't been teaching him about the faith. He's not a prey, he's not anything about the Quran, he's not anything about Muhammad, he's not. So she decides she's going to start teaching him. So every night, they have this study hour before he goes to bed, where she and he go through the Quran and they talk about it. And these evening study hours are obviously, as you can imagine, uh, you know, the vehicle of some other kinds of experiences that Hyatt is having. So it's that time, I think, that last moment in human life when the soul and the body are still one. It's the very end of that moment. And so spirituality and sexuality, it's all one thing still. It will it, over the course of the book, it will become two different things. But this is still that moment. And so I'm going to read you a little section that comes from uh, right about the time he's having these evening study hours. <coughs> the months that followed were witness to a series of spiritual experiences that would remain singular in my life, all revolving around the Quran and my evening study hour with Mina. I would leave her room feeling lively, easily moved, my heart softened and sweet. My senses heightened. Often I was too awake to sleep, and so I took to my desk white muslin still bound to my head to continue memorizing verses. He starts memorizing the Quran, which is something that uh, a lot of young folk do in the tradition. 
After long nights like these, the mornings were not difficult, as Mother warned, as she would find me at my desk past 10 o'clock. If anything, these mornings were even sweeter. The trees stippled with turning leaves and bathed in a glorious light that seemed like much more than just the sun's illumination. The white clouds sculpted against blue skies, stacked like majestic monuments to the Almighty's unfathomable glory. And it wasn't only beauty that moved me in these heightened states. Even the grease-encrusted axle of the yellow school bus slowing to its morning stop at the end of my driveway could captivate me. Its twisting joint and the large, squeaking wheel that turned around it seeming to point the inscrutable way to some rich, strange, and holy power. At school, I was starting sixth grade, I would find myself inexplicably in states of eerie calm and awakeness. For hours, something as simple as the play of sunlight against the classroom's green chalkboard could occupy me completely. Not to mention the food in the cafeteria. I remember sipping from my carton of milk one lunch hour, shocked. The full, creamy, comforting flavor seemed like a miracle. And while part of me wondered how it was I had never truly tasted milk before, Another part of me had already concluded that this experience had its source in my new contact with our Holy Quran. That October, during a game of touch football one afternoon recess, I ran downfield looking back over my shoulder and up at the sky where I expected to find Andy, where I expected to find the ball Andy, our quarterback, had told me in the huddle was coming my way. Instead, I saw something round and perfect, a brilliant white circle appearing behind a veil of clouds. And in the few seconds it took for Andy's uneasy spiral to leave his hands and come floating toward me, and during which I realized it was the sun I was seeing, I found myself already lost in sudden contemplation. The ball fell through my grip. My teammates jeered. I smiled, sheepish, apologizing. But my remorse was mostly an act. My thoughts were focused on the recollection of verses I'd memorized for Mina earlier that week. And these are some verses from the Quran. Consider the sun and its splendor, and the day that reveals it, and the night in which it hides. Consider the sky and the one who made it, and the earth spread out before you. As I made my way back to scrimmage, I gazed over at the school building, its single story of beige bricks fanning out beneath the rows of tall trees behind it. Beyond those trees was Worth Park, and beyond that, the shopping center and movie theater and local pharmacy, and beyond that, the forests and fields, and who knew what else? I turned to the road lined with split-level homes. Beyond those homes were other homes, then a highway, and further homes upon homes. I looked up at the sky, its thin cloud cover against a blue ceiling, hiding the way to the dark space I knew lay beyond, a vastness inhabited with glowing stars and turning globes and, according to our science book, an ever-expanding universe. I was suddenly awestruck by the thought of infinity. And not just of the universe I couldn't see beyond the clouds, but of the world around me as well, the countless schools and trees and homes and people in them and the countless kids on playgrounds. How many of them wondering, just like me at that very moment, about all the endless schools and homes and trees and all the infinite stars above unfolding forever? It was probably not the first time I'd ever been moved to awe by such musing, but it was the first time I had a word to put to my feelings, a word I'd learned from the Quran. Majesty. It's all God's majesty, I thought as I jogged back and took my place in the huddle. So this is the sort of thing that's starting to happen to Hyatt. This and the extraordinary heightening of his senses and the sense that he is feeling something overwhelming for this person who has come into his life because he's never been in love before. It's kind of a little paradisical moment because into this situation arises an obstacle, as a good story, in every good story there has to be an obstacle. There's a barbecue at their house one afternoon and Hyatt's dad, who's a doctor at the local hospital, has his best friend, a fellow by the name of Nathan, who's a radiologist over there, come over for lunch. Now, Nathan is Jewish, and he loves books, and he's very thoughtful, and he and Mina hit it off. And almost immediately, Hyatt begins to perceive that what Mina is feeling and experiencing and relating to Nathan in a way that has nothing to do with what she does with him. And so the seeds of a kind of jealousy begin to grow, take, take root. And that destructive jealousy is what 
propels the narrative of the book and what ends up happening in the book because of that. But before that can happen, Nathan and Mina start this very odd courtship. And one of the obstacles between this courtship between Mina and Nathan is that Mina has a four-year-old son. Well, he's five at this point in the book. And every time Nathan comes over to the house, Mina's son throws a tantrum and makes it impossible for them to be together. So Hyatt's mom keeps telling Hyatt to take the kid out of the house every time Nathan comes over. So I'm going to read you a little section about that time, from that time where Hyatt has had it with these babysitting kids. Two days later, on Friday afternoon, mother pulled me aside and asked me to watch the boy again. Nathan was coming over that night. Mom, why don't they just meet outside the house? Why does he always have to come over here? Stop complaining. I'm not complaining. Then what are you doing? I'm asking. Asking what? Why don't they see each other somewhere else so Imran doesn't know? Mother's reply was dismissive, as if she thought I should have known the answer to this already. Because your Mina aunt is a Muslim woman, and Muslims don't date. But they are dating. Mother frowned. Aren't they? I asked. Mother shook her head, then paused and nodded, then shook her head again. Not exactly, she finally said. And she went on to explain that she promised Mina's parents to safeguard their daughter's honor, and that though she was encouraging the relationship with Nathan, she'd imposed a strict limit on it as well. She never left the couple alone. She had to be present whenever they were together. According to Mother, this meant it wasn't real day. When they go to her room, they leave the door open. I check every 10 minutes. <laughs> if they want to watch something on TV, I sit here in the kitchen listening. Last Sunday when they wanted to go to Red Lobster, do you think I let them go alone? Is that what you think? <laughs> I don't know. I did not. I went with them. They sat in the booth. Hina didn't want me to be able to hear their conversation, so I sat on the other side watching every move they made. Nobody in their right mind would call this dating. Hmm? <laughs> I guess she had a point. It was late June. Mother stopped in one night to check on me before heading to bed. She peered in at the door, and I turned over, hoping she would notice I was still awake. She stepped inside, whispering, What's wrong, Mini John? I don't know. Up late? Reading? No. So far, so. Not sleepy, I guess. You want your Ami to come give you some attention. <laughs> I nodded. Aw, she purred as she came and sat down next to me. She reached out and ran her fingers along my forehead. For a long, quiet moment, we stared into each other's eyes. Is everything okay with Mina, Auntie? I finally asked. She's good, Beta. A little confused, but good. Why is she confused? Things are getting serious. Things? For once, your father did an honorable thing. He told Nathan he should figure out his intentions. Things can't go on like this forever. After all, Mina is an Eastern girl. Mother paused, shaking her head ever so slightly, a wistful wetness in her eyes. You know what that sweet man said? No. That he considered himself lucky she's been so open with him. He didn't expect she would agree to see him the way she has, and he's grateful. He's such a sensitive man, so intelligent. I really don't know why he is so close to your father. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say opposites attract, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? <laughs> That's supposed to be the same person. Hmm? <laughs> Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are the same person, I think. Don't be cheeky. <laughs> My point is, Nathan is a good man. That's what matters. That's what I keep telling you. And a good man is hard to find. I mean, she doesn't need to be told that. She's seen it firsthand in her own life, and she sees it here in this house every day. Mother was still running her fingers along my forehead. She's worried because he's Jewish. I mean, of course, there's Imran who keeps telling her he doesn't want a white father. But that's nonsense. She can't make a decision about something like that because of what a five-year-old is saying. Mother paused, drawing her hand away as she looked off. Now she's fixated on the fact that the man's a Jew, and what will people back home say, and what will the children be, Muslim or Jewish? I keep telling her she shouldn't be worried about that kind of thing, but she is so headstrong, just fixated. She chuckled, adding almost more to herself than me. Dr. Freud would have written quite a case study about your Amina. Now mother turned to me, again a sudden light in her eyes. I keep telling her the fact that Nathan's Jewish is a good thing. 
They understand how to respect women better. They understand how to let a woman take care of them. They understand how to give a woman attention. I told Meena Aunty that he will give her a life she can never dream of with a Muslim. Muslim men are terrified of women, all of them. <laughs> she leaned in, kissing me on the nose, her face just inches from mine, her soulful eyes swollen with abounding love. That's why I'm bringing you up differently, so that you learn how to respect a woman. That's the truth, Qurban. I'm bringing you up like a little Jew. <laughs> <laughs>